That's Dig from the Miles Davis CD of the same name. It was the first recording session that my guest Jackie McLean was featured on back when McLean was 19 years old. Did this date change your life? It certainly did. It frightened me to death because the day that I went into the studio to make the recording, Charlie Parker was there. He was sitting in the room with the engineers. And when I walked in and saw him sitting in there, I almost passed out because uh, he was my idol. And uh, I just felt like I couldn't play with him there. But he came out of the booth. He saw I was nervous and came over and talked to me and calmed me down, and I was able to do it. Did he say anything about what he thought of your playing? Oh, yeah. He always encouraged me to play and always told me he thought I played well. You know, a guy like Charlie Parker could destroy a young player by just saying, you don't sound good at all, you need to go home and practice, or something like that, and it could really crush somebody who looked up and admired him as much as I did. So he, I imagine he could see that, and uh, he really encouraged me a lot. He did a lot for me in my early days. Was this the first time you met Parker? No. Oh, my goodness. I used to run around behind him like a puppy dog. <laughs> we used to go downtown and wait to see him come out of the subway when he was going to work and on the, the Three Deuces on 52nd Street. And we'd be standing out there from 8.30 at night waiting for him to show up. Sometimes he didn't show up until 9, 9.15. And when he'd come out of the subway, we'd fall right in step with him and talk to him all the way around to the club. <laughs> and then he'd go inside just to be close to him, just to, so that he would know us. And he, and one he, of my buddies. Was he flattered? Did he mind? Yeah, he was, I think it knocked him out, especially when uh, he asked me, asked my friend and I if we lived in that neighborhood. And we told him, no, we came down from Harlem to see him. So he said, you guys live all the way uptown? We said, yeah. You come all the way down here? He said, yeah. And I said, I got to get going to get home now or my mother's going to kill me. Because I used to have to be home before 1030 at night. And so we'd go downtown at 8.30, see Charlie Parker, walk him to the club, stand outside the club till about quarter of 10 and make a mad dash for the subway so we could get home. What would happen if you didn't get home by 10.30? Oh, my mom would be very upset with me, you know. She would, she would uh, be very angry with me and say, listen, when I tell you to be in at 10.30, I don't mean quarter to 11 or 11. I want you in here at 10.30 or you can't go out next weekend. So... She was very strict on me that way. And would she actually have prevented you from getting out, or would you have, like, walked out the window? Oh, no. I, my mom was... I was an only child. I knew how to, to hug and kiss her and get her to <laughs> let me go. Yeah. Now, now there were times when um, uh, Charlie Parker had to hawk his saxophone in order to get money to buy heroin, and he would sometimes borrow your horn for dates. And I think there were one or two times when he actually hawked your horn as well. How did you feel about giving it to him, knowing that that could happen? Well, it, was, it wasn't was quite that simple. Uh, Charlie and I used to rent horns from off of 48th Street, 46th Street. And, uh, and when he had the horn, sometimes I needed to use it. He would loan it to me. And uh, one time he came to me and he asked me to go rent the horn from the store. And I went and did that. And then he came and borrowed the horn from me and pawned it. And so I had to go back to the store and say, uh, the horn is gone. And the man was very upset with me and, you know, was angry at me for a number of years. And, uh, but eventually Charlie straightened it out. What did he do? I think he went by the store and paid him $300 or whatever it cost. Would, would you get angry with Parker for that or just kind of accept it as part of who he was? I couldn't get angry with him for anything. I mean, he had uh, those problems that he had, I didn't understand at that particular time. I never got really angry at him about anything. Now, how did knowing him and loving his playing as much as you did change your idea of what to do on alto saxophone? Well, it, it, it's, it's, it, it's like uh, somebody teaching you the next step and showing you the next direction to go in. And I think that's what he did for all of us. I mean, uh, Sonny Rollins, uh, John Coltrane, practically all of the... I would say all of the saxophone players that came during that period. Charlie Parker was a person that pointed in the direction, and then everybody tried to develop their playing style uh, according to what he had done prior to uh, to 1945, 46, because 
early on he sounded very much like Lester Young. And uh, it was much easier to copy some of his ideas that he played when he was working with Jay McShann. But from around 1945 on, his playing became so intricate and uh, technical that very few uh, young saxophone players could, could uh, copy his stuff. Mm -hmm. 